Have a great moment, everyone. Welcome to our Philippine Literature Lecture. Our topic for this moment is the Spanish-Philippine Literature. Well, let us go first to the historical details. The Spanish colonization in the Philippines started in 1521. Okay? But it only became formalized in 1565 during the time of Miguel Lopez de Licaspe the first governor general in the Philippines. Of course, we will not forget Ferdinand Magellan, who first stepped into the country, but these were still full of wars, full of development. The The actual time we're in, uh, the Spaniards settled in the Philippines already 1565, and that is during the time of governor general Miguel Lopez de Legazpe. Literature started to flourish during this time. Well, we were, we were colonized by Spain for... Um, 33, 333 long years. So, the Spanish colonizers wanted to undermine native oral tradition, substituting everything that the native Filipinos wanted to worship their Anitos, their Aliba, their Anitos, uh, their Bathala, and they introduced this time the Passion of the Christ, one of the greatest Philippine literatures also, which is also about serving God. Now, we have also other um, Philippine literature that became very famous in this era. A good example is the Do Doctrina Christiana, which was published in 1593. This is the, actually the first book printed in the Philippines. Okay, This is a prayer book written in Spanish with an accompanying Tagalog translation. Again, this is the first book translated. Uh, this is the first book printed in the Philippines. Now, during those times, there is actually a great task of translating instructional materials because not all Filipinos during the time can understand Spanish. So the Span Spanish missionaries um, see the need to translate Spanish materials to native materials. And this is now with the, with the use of the Alibata okay, or the Malayo-Polynesian languages. So imagine they let the Filipinos burn their literature only later on to find out that the Spanish text will be translated into Malayo-Polynesian or Alibata learning system. So does that make the Spanish materials also evil? The answer is no. Because in the first place, the idea of burning the Philippine literature is not really because it's the work of the devil, but it is because they wanted history to start with themselves. They want to burn prior history so that when the people during our day study Philippine literature, they will only know of one thing, that the, that the history of the Philippines started with the Spaniards. That is selfishness in the highest degree. So eventually, these natives learn to read and write both in Spanish and in the native language. So you come to see of it. There's a delay in the progression of our educational and intellectual capacity because now we have to learn two languages. Okay? During this time, if only we were allowed to learn Malay and to progress using Malay and to um, communicate using Malay, we could have had already advancedly deal with other people. But still, the Spaniards tried to let Spanish be a part of our system. Now, during those times, you have the Ladinos. What are the Ladinos? They are bilingual natives. This time, the natives can speak Spanish and native languages. You call them Ladinos. Now, in the book of Gaspar de Belen, which is entitled, Mahal na Pasyon Yeso Cristo. Okay? Well, this is another work of a Filipino during the Spanish-Philippine era. Now, during this time of the Spaniards, plain writing material become obsolete already as they have printing press already. So they can already print and not really write their documents during that time. Now, what are the forms of literatures in the Spanish colonial era? Okay, well, you have many of them. Let us try them one by one. You have the folk songs. Okay? So during those times, you have already the song, Liron Liron Sinta, Pamule na wen, Dan Dan Soy, Sarong Bangge, Atin Kupong Sing Sing. Okay? Um, these are the type of songs that were already written during the Spanish-Philippine era. Now during those times, you have also literatures which are called 
recreational place or dula ang panlibang. Okay? So, a good example of this, of course, is your sinakulo. Okay? Sinakulo is a dramatic performance of the Passion and the Death of Christ. Now, we call this in our dialect as the Taltal. You celebrated this every, every uh, what do you call it? Every Holy Week, wherein you can see one person carrying the cross, going around the plaza, and then they will be crucified. This is the Sinakulo. Okay? So, a good example of this also is the Sinakulo di Marinduque. This is the highlight of the Morionis Festival during the Lenten season. Okay. Another kind of recreational play is the Sarzuela. This is a Spanish traditional form of musical comedy, open operatic in spoken dialogue, and satirically treated topics. So one very good example of a Sarzuela is the Paglipas ng Dilim. Okay? This is a 1920 Spanish lyric drama genre written by a Filipino writer, Precioso Palma. This is about the colonial Philippine literature with effects of satire. When you say satire, these are actual things wherein you're trying to insult people in a very good way. That is what you mean by satire. So, Azarzuela is actually a very good, a very nice drama, but it has something in its effect that causes a satire or an insult to a certain society. So, during that time, Filipino authors do not want to go against Spain because they will be punished. So what will they do? They make literatures um, literatures that in a way Spaniards will say it's a very good literature but Filipinos among themselves knew that that is a satire. That is sarcasm. That is something like they want to elaborate on the ugliness of the Spanish regime by putting it in a good, good sense of literature. And this time it's a drama. Another kind of literature during the Spanish period is the Carillo. Carillo is a drama performed during a town fiesta on a dark night after harvest. This is made by projecting cardboard figures before a lamp against a white sheet. Okay? The figures are moved like mar uh, marionettes. Okay? If you can see, this is what we're doing now, wherein we go at the back of the white cloth with a candle there, and then we do the bird, something like that. Okay? The bird is talking, something. Okay? We, we see children doing like that. Actually, that is not just a play. It's a literature. It's a carillo. So a very good example of this is that Titres, okay? An Ilocano shadow play which depicts the history and the relevance of the places of origin of the Ilocans. Today, um, if you come to think of it, uh, this there is a group in Philippine, Philippines Got Talent, okay? I forgot their name, but it is a shadow play group. Okay, now I remember it. It's the El Gama Penumbra. If you come to think of it, their shadow play, the origin of that is really the Carillo. It is a Spanish-Philippine literary type which depicts shadow literature which tells a story of a certain country, a certain culture, and that is really what El Gama Pinumbra is doing. Okay, I hope you can go to YouTube and scan for El Gama Pinumbra and their shadow play. Very nice. It's utterly world-class. It won many competitions abroad already. Next, you have the Moro Moro. This is a Spanish colonial play that depicted Moros as perpetual villains who always lost to Christians in the end. So this is a kind of drama. A very good example of this is the Moro Moro Visayan, a Visayan play which lasted for five hours depicting how the Visayan tribes defeated Muslims. Okay, anyway, this is not true. They just want to depict that there's Christian superiority over the Muslim. So a Moro Moro is actually a play. Okay, then you have the Duplo, otherwise known as the Karagatan. Okay, this is a Spanish-based literary product that is related to poetic drama in English. The people who are joining here have to compete and show who is more fluent in effective. So this is just like a debate. Okay. A good example of this is Ang Sing Sing, a Spanish duplo, which is about two persons who is winning the heart of a lady and challenges each other to find a ring okay, that the father throw into the ocean. So this is a conversational oral poetry. You call it a duplo. Another thing here is the balagtasan. Very common. It's a form of debate between two persons 
But this time, it's not shouting at each other, but using poetic languages. Okay? So, you have the balagtasan of alin ang higit na mahalaga, wikang Ingles o wikang Pilipino. So, you hear two persons debating, but they're not quarreling. They're only telling stories, telling their evidences, making it poetic. There is rhyme, there is meter. And you hear that balagtasans are really performed very well on stage and people come to see. Well, during those times, they have no theaters. So their theaters are actually full of duplos, balagtasan, and they enjoy watching this one during those era. How I wish that is also like today, wherein we have a choice. We don't only go to the theaters to watch this film, sometimes very erotic in nature, very much drug-related in, in features, very much uh, cruelty, exposed topics. How I wish today we still have venues we're in, we can go and watch dramas, the balagtasan, the duplo, because it's very nice, it's very educating, and it's very intellectually placed. Next year, you have the novella, or in English, this is called the novels. This is a long literature, okay? This is poetic. This can be also prose in nature. This is already writing about a story of a very long item. So, novella is also called books, okay? Now, there are already many Filipinos during this time who are intellectual enough to make books. Now, a very good example of this is Francisco Balagtas or Francisco Baltazar's Florante at Laura, which really belong to the high echelon of classics in the world today. There is also the No Limitangere and the El Filibusterismo of Dr. Rosé Rizal, which are considered great novels of all times. Now, those are the type of lit literatures that we have during the Spanish-Philippine period. Now, let us try to have a review you have the folk songs, recreational plays. You have, okay, folk songs, recreational plays. You have the novella. Okay, so tatlo lang, uh, you have only three there. Tatlo lang pala. So, folk songs, okay, you have the recreational plays, and you have the novels. So, these are the three types of literature during the Spanish-Philippine era. Now, Spanish colonial literary conditions. During this era, the literary topics revolved around this topic. So what do we talk about in literature during the Spanish-Philippine era? So number one, majority of the topics about God, Christianity, the divine power of the saints, Bible heroes. Remember, they are hiding behind the cross because their main aim is to penetrate the Philippines without the Filipinos knowing that they're already colonized. Okay, they have also topics about values and virtues. Okay, that's why today when you talk of Spanish upbringing, you talk about strict home values, strict home virtues. Okay, you have also argumentation. Okay, which is a notable topic with between right and what is wrong, appropriate and not very relevant topics in Spanish Philippine era. You have also superiority of Christians over Muslims. They really love to talk about this because they are the more important characters as compared to the Muslims which they view in their literature as the villains. So these are the top four um, literary topics during this era. Again, you have, they talk about religion, they talk about values, they talk about argumentations of what is right and what is wrong. And they talk about superiority of Christians to Muslims. Now, during this era, the literary outputs are witnessed already in printed paper form. Remember, in pre-Spanish Philippines, uh, in pre-Spanish literary period, they only witnessed this in natural things such as the sand, the wood, the bark of the tree, or anything that is not yet paper in structure. So in the Spanish-Philippine era, or the Spanish-Philippine literary era, you already use paper. During this era, era, the literary writing system is the Filipino native literature. Okay, We continued writing that one as long as we will discuss it with translation to the Spaniards and the Spanish output this time because we have already Ladinos or Filipinos who can write both in Filipino and uh, both in native and Spanish languages. 
During this era, there are fallacies that needs to be corrected. There are wrong things that history is teaching that we need to correct. Number one, it is wrong to say that Filipino pre-colonial literature, okay? Uh, it is wrong to say that all Filipino pre-colonial literatures are all destroyed. There are some things that survive. That is why we know what happened that the Spanish, the Spaniards threatened not to let us know today. Another thing is, Jew, uh, Filipinos write in Filipino and Spaniards write in Spanish. This is wrong. Remember, during the time, Filipinos, uh, there are already Latinos. Filipinos who can write both in Filipino and Spaniards. And there are Sp uh, Spaniards cannot write in Filipino. So during the time, the Spaniards are very much afraid because the Filipinos are more knowledgeable than them in terms of communication because Filipinos can already communicate, okay? In a by system, meaning in a two way. So the Filipinos can understand the Spaniards while the Spaniards cannot understand the Filipinos. And that is a cause of alarm because the Filipinos might be planning something which the Spaniards may not know. So during this era, how are literatures credited? Well, crediting the authors became a problem in that era. That's what I have said during the time. You can copy anything you want. You can also cite anything you want without citing the author. Because during the time, copywriting is not yet very important. It's about what lessons you can learn that counts. So, during the time, there are really no citing of authors. Unless otherwise, you really collected what you wrote and then publish it yourself, then you cannot say that you wrote it yourself. That's why, during those times, only Filipinos with money Filipinos with financial capability can really produce a book. The likes of Rizal, Marcelo Del Pilar, Graciano Lopezaina, uh, the Panganibans, okay, the Paternos. Because these Filipinos are not poor. They are members of the rich society. Actually, they are the Illustrados. So, they are not the Indios. If you come to think of it, Bonifacio could have written many, many books but he has nothing in his pocket to publish it. So two greatest literatures in the Spanish-Philippine era, well, we have named them earlier. Their books are located in the 100 greatest classics of the world. Number 50, that is the Florante at Laura by Francisco Baltazar, uh, pen name Balantas. He is one of the greatest authors in the Spanish-Philippine era of literature. Second is number 99, number 99 in the world's 100 greatest classics with the book um, No Limitang Hire, Ten Name Laong Laan. You have Dr. Jose Rizal. Okay, so these are two of the greatest authors in Spanish Philippine literature. So, I hope and pray that with these things that we are learning now, you will try to understand that Filipinos were not really educated to start education during the Spanish period because we have already our system of education, our system of communication, our system of religious beliefs before the Spaniards arrived. Okay? However, we cannot deny the fact that the Spanish arrival make it also faster and speedier for us to reach the kind of modernization that we have today. Meaning, there is a positive and there is a negative in Spanish Philippine colonization. And in terms of our literature, the positive is we learned how to write in Spanish. The negative is there are many of our cultural greats, cultural literatures that were burned because of the Spanish interventions. However, we are still very happy today that amidst all of this, we can still have surviving literatures and we can still study Philippine literature in the Spanish period and we can still know what really happened. That's why today you write something like this because of the experience of the Filipinos of the past. This is Spanish Philippine literature in its very understandable sense. Now, keep tuning in 
to Academia Gonzaga Learning Systems. And you will hear more lectures about Philippine literature and other topics in the academy. If you wish to know more of our different topics, different offerings, different discussions, just go to YouTube and then punch in the name Akagon. That is capital A, C, a capital A, small C, small A, capital G, small O, small N, Akagon. And then you will see all of our productions in Academia Gonzaga. Once again, this is Mentor Noy Gonzaga and I'm very happy to be a part of your online learning. Have a great moment, everyone.